Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Lessons from the Core, Longitudinal Assessment versus Sampling of Behavior. This webinar has been sponsored by Noldis, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. Today, joining us, we're fortunate to have Dr. Lior Bukowski, the manager of the Behavioral Neuroscience Core Facility at Tel Aviv University, and Shivang Parikh, a PhD student in Karmit Levy's lab at Tel Aviv University. Their presentations will discuss the applications of behavioral assessments in rodents with a focus on the benefits of home cage monitoring. I'm Sarah McFarland from the events team here at Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Now, before we get started, I would like to just share a few housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of today's webinar. First, this webinar is being recorded and all resources will be made available following the event. If the webinar panels in this room look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out on your internet browser to adjust the size of the viewing area. You can also resize some of these panels or make the media panel full screen. Please send questions, thoughts, and comments to us via the Ask a Question pa panel, uh, which is next to the media window at any time during the webinar. You can also take a look at the resources panel where you'll find a few links, suggested readings, um, and website links to Noldis's um, products um, that you can view before or after the webinar. We'll also be running a number of audience polls during the webinar and a survey at the end, so please chime in and share your perspectives with us. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the webinar auditorium page by refreshing your browser. This should successfully reestablish your streaming connection so you can hear us clearly. However, if this doesn't work and you continue to have issues, just use the Ask a Question panel um, to communicate your issue with our team, and we'll get you back up and running as soon as we can. Okay, so um, before we get started, I did want to run a quick audience poll. Um, so regarding duration, what kind of behavioral tests are you currently usually performing? So this is a multi-select polling question, which means you can select all that apply. Um, so there's standard short tests, which are less than 30 minutes, medium duration tests, which are 30 minutes to four hours, long duration tests, which are greater than four hours, or none of the above. So I'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer that. Okay, great. Um, thank you for answering the poll. Um, this participation is uh, really great um, for our speakers and for our sponsors to know a little bit about our audience. So thank you again for that. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Lior Bukowski. Lior, thank you so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Lior, and I run the Miles Neuro Behavioral Co Facility at Tel Aviv University. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for support in managing this lecture, and obviously, thank you, Noldus, for sponsoring us. So, in the last 40, 18 months or so, we started to imply new home cage systems into the unit, calibrating them, understanding what their abilities and limitations, and comparing them with standard tools. So, we are a fairly new uh, core facility where it exists uh, since 2015, and we're the second one in Israel. The other one is located in Weizmann Institute, and we're a part of a much bigger organization of core facilities that can take an idea from a PI or a pharma company and run with it until we have a result like a research paper or thesis. So, what is a standard sampling tool? So, for me, I call standard sampling tools standard because these are the tools that we use for the last 50 years or so. And in my book, it doesn't mean that they are old or obsolete. It actually has a few positive notes to it. First of all, if you have any kind of question, we can go to the literature and we can look it up to see if there are any kind of methods that we need to use. And also, 
we, if we get any kind of data, we can compare it with other people's uh, data or information, either for from our own strain of mice, uh, different mice methods uh, or models. And even if it's a different mouse model, we can also compare our results to their results. Now, I call it sampling because in the end, this is what we do. We sample our mice once, twice a day, once a week, once a month. And in between, we are losing information. We are losing data. In addition, most of us work in a specific Sargadan rhythm, meaning either dark phase or light phase. So we will never know what would happen if we'll examine our mice in the dark phase or in the light phase. Now, one big disadvantage of this system is that sometimes when we have a mouse model, which has subtle differences from controls, we may lose the differences because of compensation techniques. And I'm guessing most of you know this graph. So the more stress you're under, the higher your performance until that point in which the stress starts to break you. So if we're gonna use simple tasks, most likely if we have some subtle differences between our groups, we won't see any differences because they'll compensate. And this is equivalent, for example, in a case in which we have two humans which have similar motor abilities, and one of them has a slight flu, and we ask them to give us our best in 100 meter run. Most likely, we won't see any difference in their results. However, if we would have looked at their behavior at home, we would see that the one with a slight flu has some kind of a difference in his behavior. He's resting more, he's a lot less active, maybe eating more, and so on. And this is actually what happened when we tried to assess our mice, two strains of different mice, in an open field. We didn't see any differences between them. However, when we went and put them into a home cage system for 24 hours uh, of observation, we found out that the differences between them are significant. They did, C57 Black, for example, did a, last, a lot less uh, distance traveled. They explored the surrounding a lot less. They spent more time in the shelter and so on. But when we put them into the home, into the open field for a 15 minute, we didn't see any differences. Only when we looked at their behavior in a longitudinal way, we saw differences. Now, on the other hand, this is an advantage of standard tools. When we talk about motivation, when we want to really motivate our mice, for example, in some kind of an aversive task, like, oh, sorry, like field conditioning, water maze or trade mill, we can use a really high motivation like food shock or water in order to make them do whatever it is we need them to do. But if we would try to use this kind of motivation in a home cage, we would elicit so much stress that at some point it will change their behavior inside the home cage. And in some point, after so much stress, a home cage is not a home cage anymore for our animals. Now, when we talk about home cage systems, this is not a new idea. And this is a graph I actually took from PubMed about publications on home cage systems. But the peak of information, the peak of, of interest in home cage systems started roughly around 15 years ago. And if you look closely at all systems, you can uh, divide them into two different systems. One in which we monitor our mice inside the cage, inside the home cage, and the other system, which we have home cage, and the home cage is attached to a testing unit, which offer access. Now, I'm going to give you an example for each one of them during my talk, and I'll try to talk a little bit about the benefits and, and disadvantage of, of each one of them. 
Now, the most important thing about these systems is regardless of if this is an access to a testing unit or monitoring in the same home cage, we are talking about longitudinal assessment tools. And this is important because in the end, this can give us not just quantitative information, but also qualitative information. So this is information from running wheel study we did uh, from a study we published at the beginning of 2020, January 2020, we tried to assess the difference between traumatic brain injured mice and control. We tried to assess their motor performance. And one of the things we used, as I said, is running wheels. Now, if we would have looked the quantitative level only, meaning the amount of revolutions they did during the first 24 hours, 48 or 72 hours after head trauma, we wouldn't see a difference. And actually the graph you're seeing here is also after 24 days after the traumatic brain injury. But when we looked at the difference of motor performance between active phase and rest phase, meaning light and dark, we saw different patterns of motor activity, meaning that we can also use qualitative information in order to see the difference between the two groups. So another uh, way of looking at home cage systems is from a study that was published, I think, last month from a colleague of mine from Helsinki, Voltel. Now, he published a review on home cage systems, and I'm going to show you two things he, uh, he mentioned. First of all is the commercial system available by publication. And as you can see, phenotypers have 48, 46% of all uh, published data out there. And this is important for me as I run a core facility. That means that if I have some kind of a question about a method I want to use, or if I get some kind of uh, new information, I can go back into the literature and see if everybody, if someone else has this uh, method or did the data I got is relevant and so on. So this is very important for me. Now, it doesn't mean that there's nothing new to invent in phenotypers, but all in all, I have a very good uh, publication uh, uh, size that I can use in order to know what it is I need to do. Second thing is the uh, division by uh, technology. And almost 70% of all systems use video files. Now, this is very important for me as well, because one of the things that happen when we use home case systems is that in the end, people treat them like a black box. You put the mice inside, you come back after a few days, and then you see the results. Now, sometimes we get weird data. For example, in one case, in one study, we had a mouse that started his day four hours after the dark time started. Now, luckily, we use phenotypers. So I could go back, see the video file, and see that indeed this was the phenotype of that specific mouse. So instead of just thinking if the system did catch the mouse and did see everything and, and identified it correctly, I knew that whatever it is I'm seeing, I validated it by looking at the video files. Now, when we talk about looking to the assessment tools, meaning home cage systems, there are a few characteristics that are important for us. First of all, they are low stress. And that means that is because we took out from the picture the human interaction with the animal. And this is important. We create a lot of stress for our animals. And once we are not in the picture, they'll behave a little bit differently. And we see sometimes things that we haven't seen before. Second, when we do standard methods, Usually what happens is that we take our mouse from the vivarium and we put them inside a different room in a different arena and so on. This doesn't happen when we use home cage. So even if we're doing, for example, novel object recognition, 
and we put different two different objects inside the home cage. What we see is that they explore a lot less the arena, unlike in novel ob object recognition that we do in a standard methods, and they spend a lot more time exploring the objects. Now, the second important characteristic is that there are usually automated, meaning that from the moment we start the procedure, everything goes as planned and the system, the algorithm does everything by itself without any need for us to interfere. So the data is also a lot more standardized. The problem is, and this happens to me a lot, I get a lot of complaints from students and sometimes PIs that something happened and they don't understand why. And this is a very important thing, and this is why I have an asterisk there. So when we talk about home cage systems, they are automated, but automated is not fire and forget, meaning that once we put our mice inside, we have to watch them, we have to see if the system works properly. The more automated the system, the more uh, uh, smart the algorithm is, the more attention we should pay to the study itself. And last but not least, as I said before, this is a longitudinal assessment tool, meaning we can see everything that happens if it's during dark phase, rest phase, or during days. If we have some kind of phenomenon that is maturing over time, for example, if we give some kind of a drug, we can assess the behavior before, during, and after. And also, if we have some kind of a mouse model, which have an onset, we can see it before, during the onset, and afterwards as the behavior, the behavioral changes uh, mature. Now, I want to give you an example. And again, I go back to the study that we published at the beginning of 2020. So most of the study was with standard tools, and we also did running wheels, as I said before. And I want to show you our results, which are not that great from that study. So we did a motor assessment in our mild traumatic brain injured mice. As we, you can see, uh, I'm showing you rotor road, treadmill, grip thangs, and open field. And the thing is, we didn't see any differences between traumatic brain injured mice and our controls. And this was very weird for us because we know that in the human condition, there are differences. Human with mild traumatic brain injury have motor performance problem. Now, the thing that we need to understand is that in the end, there are differences between mice and humans. Mice are not humans. And sometimes I get students coming to me with questions about a specific mouse model that they don't see something and I have to explain to them that mice are not humans. And in this case, humans walk on two legs. So if we have a problem in one of our legs or two of our legs, we have subtle weakness, for example, we will see it when we test the human. However, when we talk about mice, mice have four legs. Four legs are better than two. So they can compensate a lot better. So what we did, we put our mice on the catwalk because we wanted to see if they're compensating. We tested for gait analysis. So Catwalk is uh, one of Noldu's uh, uh, tools that test gait analysis. And as you can see, we film our mice from beneath and we see each one of their legs. Now we can assess up to 70 different parameters. If it's per leg or uh, interaction between the different legs, either two legs or three legs or four legs interaction. Now we got a few parameters. I'm not going to talk about each one of them, but I'm going to show you my two favorites. So first of all, as we said, humans are have two legs. Now we stand on two legs, but we walk on one leg. Second leg drops down to the ground only for a split second to make sure that the first leg goes up. Same goes with our mice. They walk on two legs, but they stand on all four. Third leg comes down just for a split second in order for the second leg to go up into the air. And this is what we see. Usually what we see is one leg that is firmly on the ground and two legs that are in the process of either going down or going up. Now, for TBI mice, for, uh, uh, what happened was that they had a significant longer time 
putting their third leg on the ground, which was an indication for either a gait analysis problem or some kind of a balance problem. Now, we also tested and tried to see if they have something wrong with their base of support. And the further away we went from uh, the, in the head injury, we saw that they have a much bigger base of support, meaning that TBI mice, wider their uh, base of support, they stood on two legs, uh, the front two legs uh, and the hind two legs a little bit more uh, wider, so they have some kind of a additional balance. Now, second thing that we wanted to assess in that study was also anxiety. And we did it with elevated plasmids and also with the open field by looking at their visitations in the center of the open field. And funny enough, we didn't see anything, although, as we said, in humans, we see something about anxiety, high anxiety. So after publishing the paper, and we have a few more uh, uh, motor studies, motor tests uh, in this uh, study, we came to the conclusion we need to do a little bit more digging, and we put our mice inside the home cage. Now we use phenotypers. As you can see, phenotypers are from uh, Noldus, and the nice thing about the phenotypers are that every wall could be changed. So in here, what you see is a picture of a phenotyper cage with a feeder, a water bottle, and a shelter. But the protocol we used, we put also a running view, for example. Our shelter was infrared uh, transparent, and what we assessed was time spent or frequency in shelter, which is a safe zone, on shelter, which is a risky zone, and food and water intake. Now, I know that in shelter is a safe zone and on shelter is a risky zone. This is not uh, my guess, but as I told you before, phenotyper have almost uh, a little bit more than 3,000 papers out there. So somebody already validated that idea, so we could use it. Now, second thing that we assessed was also motor performance as we looked at distance traveled, activity, and running wheels. And last but not least, this is something we are still calibrating. We can also look theoretically on specific measurements behavior like grooming, jumping, rearing, and so on. So I'm going to show you two results. Uh, First one is obviously motor exploration behavior as we looked at distance moved. And surprisingly, we didn't see anything. Although it looks like we have something here, the differences are not significant. So there was no real difference when we looked at distance moved. We also looked at uh, running wheels. But again, we didn't see anything, not during light phase or dark phase. But what we did do in distance traveled, in distance moved, we did the same thing as we did in uh, the paper from January 2020. What we did was a, a ratio of circadian rhythm. So we divided distance traveled during light phase, meaning rest, uh, to distance travel during dark phase, meaning active. And what we got is a significant difference between MTBI mice and controls, meaning that MTBI mice, again, were a lot more active during rest phase and a lot less active during active phase. Now, second thing that we wanted to assess was some kind of a psychiatric assessment, as we said, with the shelter. And what we saw was that during dark or active phase, there was a significant difference and TBI mice spent a lot more time in the shelter. Now, mind you, this is not due to some kind of a motor dysfunction because there, are no, there is no difference. And we saw also indication for that difference during rest phase, although most likely this is a floor effect because both of them were a lot more resting in the, in the shelter. Now, as we said, if there's a difference, there's some kind of a psychiatric difference. Now, it doesn't mean that this is anxiety, but it can also be some, some kind of depression or motivation. And right now, what we are doing is we are uh, trying to assess, we are trying to calibrate a new uh, method for psychiatric assessment, depression and anxiety in the phenotypers. And in the meantime, 
our mice are running again in the uh, phenotypers for cognitive assessment. Now, I don't have any data from TBI mice on cognition as they're still running, but I want to show you uh, data from another study we did with, co with cognition wall, with cognitive assessment, uh, and show you a little bit about the results in cognition. Now, cognition wall is a cognitive assessment method that was established by Silix, which is a Dutch CRO. Uh, they are really amazing, and you have here a link to their uh, a, a website. They have there a lot of studies they did and published about it and other uh, methods that they used as well. And it's very easy. It's very simple methods. As you can see, you have a cognition wall. You have a wall inside the home cage, and it has three holes. And only the left hole is the correct one. Every time they go through that hole, every five times they go through that hole, they get a foot pad. If they go through the two others, they don't get anything. Now, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to teach our mice the same thing, but in standard methods, first of all, I had to use starvation method, which would have changed their behavior from the beginning. And second, it would take me, if I would do 15 or even 30 minutes a day, it would have taken me between weeks to months to teach the mice this kind of behavior. However, when we do cognition wall inside the home cage, it takes us roughly between four to six, sometimes eight hours to teach naive mice to go into the left hole. As you can see, this is after, I think, four or five hours. The mouse is going in and out of that specific hole. It already learned that if you want to get food, it's only the left hole. Now, we present the result like this. This is the left graph. So we are assessing the amount of entrances into the left hole out of the entire entrances to the uh, three holes. And what we are looking for is a criteria of 80%. So we are assessing how much uh, entrances he did to the, uh, up until he reached a criteria of 80%. From 30 entrances, we want 26 or 24 entrances to the correct one, to the left hole. This is the work from uh, Hagit uh, Eldar uh, lab. The, her student Tanya did the, the task and she used a cognitive enhancer drug. And as you can see, animals that got the drug learn the procedure a lot faster. And as she was, she was suspecting that they are also hyperactive, she also tested for the amount of uh, entrances altogether they did during the 24 hours they spent inside the home cage, inside the phenotypers, and she also found out that they play a lot more with the cognition wall. Now, I told you at the beginning that there are roughly, if we divide all the systems into two parts, we have two types. We have one, like phenotypers, which we assess mice inside the home cage. And we have another one in which the uh, testing unit is attached to the home cage. And this is a nice example. This is a touch screen from Phenosis, uh, which is a German company. And as you can see, it has three parts. It has a home cage in which we can put as many mice as we'd like, uh, but there is a limitation and I will speak about it in a second, in a few slides. We, you, we have a RFID a tunnel a sorter that can sort the mice. So in every step of the way, we have only one mouse in the testing unit. And the testing unit itself is a touchscreen chamber. We have from one side a touchscreen and in the other we have a reward tray. Now, this is the work from Liron. She's establishing the protocol. She's from Hagipix Lab. And we use around five to six animals uh, at each time. Uh, this is obviously strain dependent. The detection, as I said, is RFID chips, which are injected to the mice themselves. 14 days of learning the tasks, uh, plus a day or two, maybe three for the task itself. The learning has five different steps. And the motivation, again, is food pellets but this is not under starvation. The mice are eating as they should and they're keeping their weight. So let's talk a little bit about the protocol. 
So as I said, there are five steps of learning. First one is habituation. In that stage, which takes 24 hours, we open all doors and mice can go in and out the testing unit just to check it out and see that nothing is wrong. And we also give them food pellets through the uh, tray itself. Second stage, initial touch. They have to put their nose to the food tray in order to get the food itself. Third stage is must touch. They have to touch the touch in itself in order to get the food. As you can see from the video file. Now, fourth stage is must initiate. They must put their nose into the food tray and only then they get the food uh, after they touch the touch screen. And fifth and last stage is the punishment incorrect. Meaning now the difference is that if they touch the wrong side, they're getting punished by a delay. Meaning they have some kind of a delay in which they cannot initiate a new session. And then we go to the test itself. The test is delay non match to sample. Those of you who do not know delay non match to sample, this is a working memory task. And the protocol for that is this. Uh, we have a pre-session, which have five dark windows, and then exposure to sample, which means one of the windows get lit. And then we have some kind of delay. Again, our mouse has to put his nose into the food tray to start the delay. And then he has to pick the window which was not lit before. Delay non-match to sample. He has to match the other window. Now we can make the protocol a little bit more harder if we have to. We can do it by making the lit windows a lot more closer to each other. And then it's a little bit more difficult for them. Another option is instead of lit windows, we can have some kind of a figures or shapes, different shapes. So this is how we get the data. And the data is divided to two parts. One is the learning process, the training for each day. And we can see if there's a difference in the learning protocol in the learning process, meaning that they need, uh, one group needs a lot more sessions in order to reach a criteria. Now, mind you, this is just from uh, the establishing uh, part of the protocol. We are still establishing it. This is data from only three and four animals. And after we look at the learning process, we can also see the data from the test, which shows us how is their working memory. Now, last but not least, one important limitation of attached testing unit. Now, this is not just for attached testing unit. This is a limitation in my book for any group housing in home cage system. This is a schedule of using the uh, testing unit for each one of the mice. Now, this, the test starts at 8.30 and they start, each one of them can go into the test unit for five times the entire 24 hour uh, period. And as you can see, if you have a dominant mouse, you can go whatever it is you want. So once the, the study starts, he can go inside. Once the protocol starts, he can go inside, eat as much as he want and do his five times in the testing unit. However, if you're a submissive mouse, like our control two, they won't let you go inside the unit. They will stay on the tube. The dominant mice usually stand on the tube and don't allow you to go into the testing chamber, even if it's not their turn. When can you go inside? Only when they are not looking. So it's in the middle of your sleep cycle and once you're super hungry. So we may not know if the differences that we see is because one of the mice is dominant and he can eat whenever you want and he he's doing the cognition task during the right hours meaning the active time and the other one which is doing the study doing the protocol when he's super hungry and during his rest phase so we have to pay attention to that 
And one of the things we are doing right now to control this is lower the amount of mice inside the home cage. So just a quick conclusion. Uh, I wanted to show you, I wanted to talk to you about the process we are doing in our core facility when we started to get the home cage systems and the way that we address them and their interaction with standard testing units uh, tools. So first of all, when we started it, there was a lot of questions about what is the what is the place of home case systems regarding standard tests? And right now we know that standard tests are still a lot, have a lot of importance for our studies. There are windows to everything that was done so far. They uh, allow us to compare data to other studies around the world not just that happening now, but also uh, that happened uh, up until now. And we can also enlist a lot more motivation in specific methods and specific tools that we cannot do in home cage. Now, home cage systems allows us to see all the data in a longitudinal way and helps us to, th to see things in a different way, either in, through looking at the different patterns or looking at things that, looking at behaviors that we couldn't see when we looked at standard tests. And when we combine the two of them, we see everything in a more holistic point of view. So we see everything together. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Lior, for that wonderful presentation. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, we are going to run another audience poll. So, what would be your main interest for using a home cage system to study motor function or activity, general well-being and animal welfare, learning and memory, psychiatric-like behavior such as anxiety and depression, circadian ryth rhythmicity, food and water intake, social behavior of multiple individuals, or something else? So this is a multi-select, so you can select more than one. And I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to answer that. There's a lot of options there, so <laughs> take your time. Okay, great. Um, thank you for answering that. And now we will move on to our second speaker. So um, I would like to welcome Shivang Parikh. Um, Shivang, thank you so much for being here today with us. And um, take it away whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Shivang Parikh. I'm a PhD student from the lab of Professor Karmit Levy at uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, our lab basically studies the questions uh, related to the skin biology and uh, specifically mel melanoma. Uh, uh, during my PhD, I have been working on several projects uh, since this is uh, this webinar is related to the behavioral uh, part. So I did use behavioral uh, uh, studies and, and uh, tools for, for answering my research questions. So I will talk uh, regarding this today. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, how, to, how I deciphered basically uh, the effects on appetite changes in presence of UV exposure. Uh, and I would like, also like to thank the sponsors for this opportunity to allow me to present in this uh, webinar. So how, being a biologist, uh, how, why behavior is important? Because the behavior is the capacity and the potential to express and respond to external or internal stimuli. Uh, sometimes what happens is that uh, we all always uh, run uh, behind the quest for looking up for novel genes or mutations or studying different pathways, but we miss out what's actually happening uh, from the behavioral point of view. Uh, being a biologist, that's that's my opinion. Uh, it's like uh, studying a tip of an iceberg where there's a lot happening inside, but uh, we, it's also important what's happening at the phenotypic level, where several factors are involved, including mental, physical, and social. Uh, the influence of the external uh, stimuli from the environment or from the society, which includes uh, social factors 
and also the internal uh, stimuli within uh, the living system, which includes uh, anatomical factors, physiological, molecular, and biochemical factors. So just to give a brief uh, idea of what is uh, UV, uh, there are like uh, different kind of radiations uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum from the sun. Uh, UV has a specific wavelength uh, and it can be bifurcated into three uh, categories, A, B, and C. UVC cannot reach uh, theoretically the and practically also the, the earth because of the ozone layer which blocks it. UVA and B actually reach uh, earth. And uh, even if uh, we are not directly uh, getting exposed to the UVB radiation, we still receive substantial amount of UV radiation. And the maximum intensity of the UVB radiation is between 11 to 2 o'clock uh, during the daytime. And in literature, uh, UV uh, has been related to induce uh, several effects, uh, principally the skin pigmentation, which is very well established, DNA damage, the effect on the hair follicles and a uh, few years uh, before a study was published which uh, which uh, said which exhibited that uv also has an effect on the fatigue so our human uh, skin actually uh, looks something like this which can be uh, bifurcated into epidermis and the dermis as principal layers and we also have a, have the adipocytic hypodermis layer beneath the dermis and uh, as you can see in this diagram when when the sun hits the skin the keratinocytes uh, that there is a, a p53 in the keratinocytes which gets activated which uh, induces the transcription of uh, POMC, which is a large precursor protein and this large precursor protein which uh, is uh, it can be cleaved into further peptides like beta endorphin ACTH and alpha msh some of them can be released into the blood to induce the effects. And the alpha message goes to the neighboring, uh, neighboring melanocyte uh, to induce uh, the transcription initiation for MITF, which secretes pigment uh, molecules, which are shipped back into the keratinocytes, where they stay like umbrellas, uh, like structures, uh, pro providing more protection to the keratinocytes for the, for the further damage. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the, there's a group in the in the, in the uh, US which uh, actually showed that when mice were given the UV light, it caused them fatigue and it caused them addiction. Uh, I'm uh, referring this paper because uh, this paper basically is one of like a really good papers which uh, show a direct connection of UV uh, and the skin biology you you, uh, using the uh, ro robust uh, uh, animal behavioral techniques. So here we ask a question for this uh, particular project that how can we measure the appetite related behavioral changes and are these changes prevalent in both males and females? I would like to uh, mention that uh, the work which I'll, I'll show now uh, was done in collaboration with Dr. Leo, Dr. Lior and uh, he designed all the experiments and uh, it was an amazing collaboration working with him. So what we did is we took C57 black mice, we shaved them from the dorsal side to get rid of the hair and we started exposing them for the constant dose of the UVB radiation, which is a well-established dose in the field of skin biology, which is 50 millijoule per centimeter square. That's like receiving a weekly dose of go off of a sun you know, on, on a sunny week in California. So as you can see here, we used bo uh, both the males and females for, for our studies. Uh, on the left panel, you can see the males and on the right, uh, you can see the females. On the top panel, you can see the mock uh, mice with no pigmented uh, pigment accumulation in their ears. And on the bottom panel, the UVB exposed mice with pigmentation. Uh, this pigmentation was measured uh, using the dermal spectrophotometer. And as you can see, the significant uh, induction of melanin pigmentation, which is accumulated in the ears from, uh, from, from week one after the UV, which is same in, in uh, both the genders. Uh, now uh, we wanted to, we were interested to check if the UV is basically affecting the appetite related behavior for the mice uh, or not. 
And for this, we wanted to see, uh, uh, develop the tools or use the existing tools and modify them uh, in which we could see uh, small but uh, strong changes uh, in the in the in the appetite uh, related behavior for these mice in presence of UV. So here we took uh, a staircase test, as you can see in this video on the left hand side, uh, which is classically used to test the motor function in in rodents. Uh, it's it's a closed chamber where animals uh, have like really limited moments and. Uh, uh, they had to make an effort in order to reach out to the food. And on the right hand side, uh, we took open field and we placed the food in the center as uh, mice are neophobic and are afraid of uh, open space and bright light. So we took advantage of these two uh, parameters and we challenged them. Uh, the idea behind these two behavioral tests was that, that the animals need to make an effort in order to reach out to the food. So this was our idea that indeed, if they were hungry, if, if they are hungry, they should reach out to the food by making an effort. So as you can see in this uh, slide on the left-hand side, when we expose, uh, uh, when we did this uh, test uh, and we exposed the uh, animals uh, with the UVB, we see a strong uh, difference, a significant difference in the pellets consumed uh, by the male mice, which were exposed to the UV compared to the uh, control, while the attempt was not changed. And on the right hand side, you can see that there is no significant differences between uh, the pellets consumed uh, by female mice, which were given UV and the control ones. This is the data from the open field test. Uh, so as you can see on the left hand side is the is the panel with the data from from uh, the male mice after uh, the uv and mo or mock radiation as you can see that uh, the significant uh, uh, increase in the pellet pellet consumption uh, the total distance uh, traveled was significantly less which makes sense because they were spending much more time in the in the center area where actually the food was as you can see in the representational images of this heat maps uh, also, we measured the velocity, which was uh, significantly less in the UVB treatment. The activity was less. They spend more, uh, significantly more time in the center, the male mice. Where on the other hand, as you can see in the right hand panel, uh, for the females, none of the parameters, there was no significant differences or no changes uh, after the UVB radiation. So this actually the idea was to to challenge the mice and uh, see like what what uh, what was according to our hypothesis if we can see some differences in the appetite related behavior but this uh, both the experiments were done in a in in a risky environment which is risky for the for the for the animals the next what we wanted to do is we wanted to check uh, what's happening in the home cages so as Dr. Lior mentioned in his in his talk earlier that uh, uh, we have it's it's so, so much uh, required to do a longitudinal analysis because we lose so much data. And this is what happened with us that we started uh, checking the, the parameters of the food like once or twice a day or like on a weekly basis and we could not see any any differences. But then we introduced our animals to to the automatic uh, phenotypers. So we again took uh, the C5 to 7 black mice and started giving them the UVB radiation. And we introduced them for 24 hours in, in the phenotypers, automatic phenotypers, which was measuring uh, how much time animals access the food. Uh, the, every time the animal accesses the food, uh, the, in, the infrared beam breaks and it counts that the particular animal in this uh, cage access to the food. So we could know like how many number of times they reach out to the food. So we did, we did this in presence of, uh, of UV and uh, control animals, as you can see, uh, uh, during the active and the resting phase, we did not want it to lose data. So we, we did it in both the phases. And as you can see in the left panel, uh, especially in the beam break uh, graph, the upper graph, uh, that we see a significant differences in the mice, uh, in the males that were given the UV treatment that accessed uh, the food areas significantly more compared to the controls. 
Uh, while in on the other hand, if you see the females, that you don't see a significant differences between uh, between the control and the UVB treatment. So this was quite interesting for us. So uh, it's for from my point. Uh, from my point of view or perspective, I would say that it's really important to, to bridge the link between the behavioral studies and it can be also good to to bridge between uh, for uh, between the cancer biology because uh, cancer itself is related with uh, so much uh, different phenotypes and uh, so it's, it's really important uh, for us to study what's happening at the phenotypic level because uh, People tend to lose their appetite, and there is influences or influence of the external parameters, as you can see in one of the papers which was which was there uh, in in Science in 2013, which says uh, that uh, how the effect of climate is affecting the aggressiveness in humans, and also this paper which I, I mentioned earlier uh, that how uh, the UVB is basically of mediating the addiction like behavior and fatigue in, in, in mice. So it will be really uh, interesting and uh, uh, nice uh, like uh, to also uh, study the research question from the behavioral point of view. Uh, I would like to thank my professor, Professor Karmit Levy uh, and Dr. Lior Bikoveski for amazing collaboration and uh, other uh, scientists who helped me uh, design the experiments for this particular part. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Great, thanks so much for that wonderful presentation, Shivang. Um, before we move on to our live Q&A with our speakers, we are going to run one last audience poll. Um, so thank you in advance for your participation. So this is a single select question. And the question is, what do you consider the biggest possible advantage of home cage testing? Um, so there's testing after habituation and novelty of the environment that has disappeared. Uh, investigate animals in a more natural environment. Replacing a battery of one-dimensional tests by multi-dimensional test protocols. Standardization of tests and procedures. Replacing a human operator by a fully automated system. Testing in the dark period when humans are not around less time consuming for the test operator or something else. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer that. All right. Great, thank you uh, for your responses there. There's quite a few options. So um, just a couple more seconds before we move on to our Q&A. Great, okay, so I'm going to welcome our speakers back. Shivang and Lior, you're back on the line. Um, and we're going to start our Q&A off with our very first question. So, uh, Lior, this question is for you. Um, do you think that home cage systems can replace the standard tools that are used today? Um, well, obviously for my talk, uh, no, but um, when you look today at the clinical level, you see that doctors are using more and more technologies and apps to track people at their homes. But in the end, they're still using the differential diagnosis by combining it with doctor appointments and also by using uh, some kind of tests in the lab. Now, this is the same for us. When we work in behavior, we actually are doing differential diagnosis. And there is a very big advantage of testing our mice in the home cage, but we can never, I think, at least for now in, in the technology existing today, we cannot replace entirely the standard tools. Not to mention that all the data that we have today, or 99% of the data we have today, comes from standard sampling tools. So until we will have uh, a lot more data in home cage systems, in my point of view, we cannot replace them. So we will have to do both, if anything. Okay, great answer. <laughs> um... And thank you for that. So we have another question here. Um, this one is for you, Shivang. Um, the question is, can we check the appetite-related differences 
irrespective of anxiety? Uh, yes, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, since open field is also used to, like in first place, it's used to measure the anxiety. Uh, for this particular uh, experiments, we also perform the elevated plus miss test to see if the these effects were uh, irrespective of of anxiety. And uh, there's like a very very fine line because since uh, this group already showed that the beta endorphin is releasing uh, into into the blood and uh, causing the behavioral effects. So uh, you see a bit of anti-anxiety effects, but uh, considering the, I, I haven't shown the data here, but considering uh, the results from our experiments of the elevated plus maze test, we don't think that this effect is, is based on, on, on anxiety. Great. Okay. So let's move on to our next question. So Lior, this question is for you. Um, the question is, what do you think about the use of metabolic measurements in the home cage in regards to behavioral assessment? Um, well, I spoke about it in my, in my talk that mice do compensation. Uh, we also do it. And I think the most amazing thing that when we have uh, some kind of a study in which we don't see any difference in behavior, but we know from histology or, or other measurements there is a difference. Metabolism can give us more information about how mice compensate. So, for example, if they are both doing uh, uh, match to sample uh, the same way, they have the same results, but one of them is using a lot more energy so metabolism will give us the answer for that. So metabolism can show us if our mice, if, if they have some kind of an onset of, of whatever it is that we are studying and if they are doing some kind of a compensation. And I think that in the end, this is, by the way, one of our future uh, wishful thinking. So we can combine metabolic measurements inside our behavioral home cage so we can see if mice are actually compensating when we're uh, looking at subtle differences between groups. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here. Um, Shivang, this question is for you. Um, did the UV light damage the visual system of the mice? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, we gave the UV for around eight weeks. It's uh, it's a not a acute dose of the UV, so we did not check actually if it's damaging the visual uh, activity in the mice. But uh, considering uh, the considering the the normal uh, uh, any the control animals itself. We did not see any differences uh, in their eye, but uh, I would just like to tell that when we used uh, one of the knockouts, uh, I, 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 would, I won't mention it uh, specifically what kind of knockout, but when we knocked a, a user a, a specific skin specific knockout, we saw that there is inflammation and redness of the eye when we give the UV after eight weeks. So yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right, um, so that's our, I think going to be the last question um, that we're going to take today. But like I did say, um, we will be creating a question and answer report where our experts will answer all of your questions. So if you do have any more questions, please submit them now. Um, we are going to move on to our final slide here, which um, is thanking you all for being here. So thanks for attending live um, and for participating in the polls and the question and answer period. I know we really appreciate it. Um, in closing, thank you again for taking part in this webinar and we look forward to having you with us again soon.